malicious software. What I want to do in this topic is uh, introduce some of the terminology, some of the um, classifications of malicious software. Malware, for short. Viruses, worms, trojans, and a few other issues. We're not, we will not go into too much detail about the different types of malicious software. In subsequent topics, we'll see uh, some more detailed examples. So later, there's a topic on denial of service attacks, which is somehow related to malicious software. Um, I'll show a couple of examples of worms. Um, so we may see other forms of malicious software in other topics. Malicious software, or malware for short. A program that is inserted into a system, usually covertly, so secretly, trying to hide the fact that we're inserting it, with the intent of compromising the confidentiality, integrity, or availability of the victim's data, applications, or OS, operating system. Or annoying or disrupting the victim. Okay, so many things you can do. So some program inserted into some system, computer system, CIA comes up here, confidentiality, integrity, availability, our requirements, our general set of requirements, and we want to compromise them. That's what this malicious software wants to do from an attacker's point of view. Or annoy the, the user. So we have a victim and we have an attacker or a malicious user uses this software to uh, annoy or attack the victim. There are different types, many different types of, of malware. So we will mention some of them and we'll try and classify them into different uh, categories. And you can classify them in different ways. There's not just one classification of what is malware. Two ways, and we'll use that through these slides, is how that malware propagates, how it moves from one computer to another computer, and what that malware does, the payload. The payload is the... Um, is the uh, operations carried by that malicious software that perform some action. So when it gets to the victim's computer, what does it do? So how it spreads, we'll talk about a virus, viruses, worms, and social engineering as examples of how to spread uh, malicious software. And what can it do? Uh, we'll talk about that it can corrupt the data or the, the software on a particular system, uh, introduce and mention zombies and bots, steal information, so that's one thing that it may do, uh, hide, stealthing, hide itself. And we'll finish with some countermeasures, with some general concepts used in antivirus software. Antivirus software is usually trying to detect malicious software. Not just viruses, we'll see other malicious software. So we'll go through, look at some malware by the way that they propagate and then by what they do, the payloads, and finish with some countermeasures. A virus, a piece of software that infects programs and copies itself to other programs. So programs, some software, a virus somehow infects that existing software and then copies its Self to other instances of either that software or other software. Simple example is that a virus infects, uh, so think of Microsoft Word as a program. There's an executable, word.exe. Uh, if a virus infects that program, we can think it infects that executable file. And then that virus may copy itself to other programs. So if it's infected word.exe, then it may, may later copy itself to xl.exe and try and infect that. That's the general concept. A virus will go through different phases. We can think it's initially dormant, it's doing nothing, it's idle. And then there may be some event that happens on the computer that activates that virus. The event may be um, some t time or date has been reached or some us the user does something on that computer 
that activates that virus. So for example, the user opens a file and that triggers the, vial, the virus to execute and move into the next stage. So the next stage is it propagates. It copies itself from one program to, an, to another. So this is the case if the virus has already infected word.exe, then some event like opening a Word document triggers that virus to then find other executables that it can infect and copy itself to those other executables. The virus often performs some, some function, some operation. So there may be some other event that triggers the virus. So again, it may be opening a file, it may, may be some time-date combination that triggers the virus to execute where the function is performed. And the execution that depends upon the payload. It may be some harmless, it may display some message on the screen saying you've been infected by this virus. Or it may be malicious, like deleting your files on your hard disk. Or we'll see an example later of encrypting your files on the hard disk and asking you for money to decrypt them. Okay? So there are many different functions it can perform. So just the general phases, there are some events that trigger it to propagate to other pieces of software and some events that trigger it to perform some function and whatever function it's programmed to do. So viruses in this uh, simple uh, form we can think they infect other programs, normal programs on your computer. Think of executable files, although they don't have to be executable files. And then usually they want to spread and they try to infect other programs on your computer. And often they'll perform some function that, uh, depending on what they're trying to achieve. Because they infect executable files and they need to copy to other executables, they need to know something about how those executable files are structured uh, and how they're going to be used. So they're usually specific to operating systems. Because on one operating system, uh, the format for executable files is different than other operating systems. So the virus is programmed for a specific uh, format of an executable file and therefore usually specific to OS's. Or hardware platforms, so a particular uh, instruction set, a particular type of CPU um, because uh, it's specific to the executable files. Yep. Yes, okay, so the, the virus is usually programmed specific to some executable files. So uh, it, in detail it will depend upon how that, that existing program works. So um, yes, that may depend upon the, the, the version of the program and especially the version of the operating system. So when we say it's specific to operating systems, that may mean different versions of the same general operating system. Windows XP is a different operating system than Windows 8. Okay? All right, they're both Windows, but if you look at the, the, the code of the operating system, you can think they're different OSs. Uh, so yes, it can be across specific to an OS. Okay? And it can be specific to particular versions of programs that they're trying to execute, to uh, infect. Because the virus would need to take advantage of some knowledge of how that program that it's infecting works. And the pro that's usually specific to the OS, the particular OS, the version. But in some cases it may be general. The virus may work across multiple versions and even across multiple operating systems, it's possible. But it's just harder to do. Let's look at a virus. And all right, it's not a real virus, it's just the structure of a very, very simple virus and try to give an idea of what it would do. Uh, it's just some pseudocode of a virus. Where some program V, this is, this is our virus V. 
Uh, and it's what, think of it as it infects an existing executable file, so some program. So it's going to attach itself to an existing program. Uh, one way to visualize it is that, and I think the next slide does it, forget about the details here, uh, we have some program like word.exe, that's the program we're trying to infect. And think that the virus, when it infects it, attaches itself to the start of that program. So we have an executable, uh, a, a five megabyte file, uh, and if, if, if that's infected in this simple virus, think of that simple virus is inserted itself at the start of that executable. So if the virus was 100 kilobytes and our normal program was 5 megabytes, then the normal program becomes, what, 5.1 megabytes. Uh, let's make that a bit clearer. Just with an example, the concept we're trying to show with this virus when we look at it is that we have uh, we have our normal program, the one we're going to infect. Let's say, as an example, that's the file. And if it's infected, in the simple terms, the virus think is, it attaches itself to the, to the start of that file. This is our virus code. So in fact, word.exe contains all of the instructions of the virus plus the original word.exe. So when you now execute word.exe, you double click on the file or you open word by some means, then your computer executes the code in the virus first and then it executes the normal code for word. Okay, that is, opens up Microsoft Word and allows you to edit documents. So importantly, we think of the, the virus code is inserted at the head of the executable program such that when you execute this program, it first executes the virus code. What is the virus code? That's what this pseudocode is showing. So this is the code that's at the start of the normal program. Or the, the, the idea behind it. Uh, what have we got? Go to main, okay? Here's main. Just think of a subroutine or a function. Uh, the main program for the, of this virus is that the steps, we infect the executable, we infect an existing program. If some trigger is pulled, if some event occurs, then we do some damage. Whatever damage we program the virus to do, like delete files, uh, uh, display some message. And then we go to next. So if, if we trigger is pulled after they check, we do damage then we go to next, and next is here, and think of after next is execute the normal program. So the code that comes after next is the normal code for word.exe. The idea is that when someone starts word, first the virus code is executed, and then the normal word code is executed, so word opens and the user doesn't know any different, because they get Microsoft Word opening and they can edit their files. So that's the, the first approach. When someone opens Word, this virus infects other executables. If there's some event, it says trigger pulled, then do some damage, and then continues with the normal Word operation. And then the rest is really, well, what does infect executable do? What is trigger pulled, and what is do damage? They're the subroutines above it. Infect, infect executable. The concept here is that we perform some loop. We get some random executable file on the hard disk. 
So let's say we've infected word.exe. Go search the hard disk for other exe files. Okay, we find one. excel.exe. If the first line of that file we just found contains this special string 1 to, through to 7, then try again. Then go back to loop and find another random file. This is saying if the file you just found is already infected, get another one. The idea is to infect other files which are not yet infected. So in fact we include a special string at the start of our virus that is an indicator that this file is already infected. That's the, the concept here that find some fi file, check if it's already infected. If it is, then go back and find a different file and keep doing that until you find a file that's not infected, that it doesn't have this special string at the start. And if we find a file that's not infected, then attach our code to the start of that file. Prepend the virus to the file. So we find a file excel.exe which is not infected. We take that and attach all this code to the front. So it's just the concept here. So the virus, when it executes, it looks for other files, so maybe there's another file on the, uh, on the system. It finds other files, and if it finds one which doesn't have this special string at the front, and it will not if it's not infected, then it attaches itself to that file it just found. Our virus now infects this other executable file. And it can then, when someone starts Excel, the virus will execute and then repeat, try and exe infect other executable files. There are many details that a, a real virus needs to, to check to do this. So it's, it's not as simple as we show, but we're just showing the concept here. So infect another executable. Once you've done that, then if trigger pulled, what does that mean? Well, it's just a check that if some conditions return true, and that's whatever the pro virus is programmed to check. For example, if the date, the current date, is greater than some value, or if some, fi some special file exists on the system or doesn't exist. So perform some check. And if the check returns true, the trigger is pulled, means we want to perform some damage, then we call the subroutine do damage, which does whatever it is programmed to do. And that can be many things. Delete all the MP3 files in a particular directory. Or display a message on the screen, you've been infected. Or send a message across the internet to some command and control server to say that this has, this has been infected. So the damage may be many different things. Once we've done that damage, then we'll go to ne next, which then moves on to the code of word.exe. Word opens, the user just uses Word, and they know no different. The user of the computer doesn't know that the virus has been executed, because from their perspective, they double-clicked on word.exe. This code executed in a very short amount of time, and Word opened. So they don't know it's been infected. So that's the basic concept of a very simple virus. Any questions on this concept? How to get that to be successful, that virus, requires a lot of details. What, what the day? Uh, is this called zero day? No. If trigger pulled is just some condition saying, uh, 
it could be always returned true. It's a condition that the virus programmer has said that we only want to do damage under certain conditions. Now what are those conditions? Well, what does the virus program want to, want to achieve? That is, we may not always want to um, do that damage. It may be if we want to delete, right, we want to delete particular files on the user's hard drive. We want to delete all the MP3s. So the virus infects the executables. When the user runs those executables, the virus deletes all the MP3 files. So it may, not, may want to just delete those MP3 files under certain conditions. If the, uh, if the, the computer has internet access and it's got a BitTorrent application installed, if that's the condition, then delete all the MP3 files. Or if the, the date is after some um, pre-programmed value, then perform the damage. So what is the, the conditions? It depends upon what the virus is trying to achieve. There can be many different types of conditions. If a particular file exists on the computer, then do some damage. What is the damage? Again, I think you can think of many examples of damage you can do on a computer, both harmless and, and harmful. We'll see some examples of what damage other real viruses and, and malicious software has done. All right, how do you detect, how do you prevent such a virus? A very simple approach. Let's say word.exe originally the file was one megabyte and the virus code is uh, 100 kilobytes. So when word.exe is infected, the file itself, itself word.exe is now 1.1 megabytes. It's bigger than the original version of the word.exe file because we've attached some extra code to it. So easy way to detect if we've got a virus attached is to look at the file sizes. Compare them against some uh, original known file size. We know that word.exe should be one megabyte. If we see it's larger, then something's changed it. So we can look at what the expected pattern or the expected file size is in this case and check whether it's been changed. That's what a, a simple virus, antivirus software could, could do. One way around that, compress the virus. That is, the virus wants to hide itself so the antivirus software cannot find it. Well, in this case, a compression virus could compress itself, uh, sorry, not compress itself, compress the, the program that it infects such that the total size is the same as the original size. So this picture shows P is the program we're infecting. The original size was, if we can see it here, was this size. What the virus does when it infects is that it first compresses the word.exe file down to a smaller size such that when we attach the virus code, the total size is the same as the original. So in this case, if word.exe was originally 900, uh, 1 megabyte, then the virus would compress it to be smaller. So compress word.exe to be slightly smaller and then attach the virus to that. So here's our virus and this is the compressed word.exe such that the total size is the same as the original one megabyte. So a simple check of the file size doesn't help now with the antivirus software because word.exe after it's infected is the same size as before. Okay, so the concept here is for the virus to try and hide itself by not making things look different on the, oper on the computer so the antivirus software cannot find the virus. A very simple approach. 
So the code itself for the compression virus, uh, similar to before, but it also includes a, a step of when we infect the file, we actually compress that file. Compress it to a size such that it's, when we attach the virus code, we get the original size again. So that's a way for the virus to try and hide itself from antivirus software. Of course, you need to decompress the file when someone runs word.exe. So this is a very simple approach. Of course, the current viruses are much more complex than this, but they use the same concepts. They use concepts to try and hide themselves from antivirus software. So we need to infect the files. From the virus's perspective, it wants to infect the files, but at the same time, it wants to stay hidden from software that's trying to detect it. Well, here's a case where I compress, but it becomes much more complex than this than that the antivirus can now look for patterns of code. So if it looks for patterns of code to try and detect the virus, then, well, what does the virus do? Change, the, change itself such that the antivirus cannot detect those patterns. So the simple concept of a virus, infect other programs and then do damage, optionally do damage when uh, those programs are executed. There are many thousands, if, if not hundreds of thousands of different viruses uh, in existence, many different types. Uh, here's a simple classification of types of viruses by the target that they infect, what they're trying to infect. A boot set sector infector, a virus tries to infect the, the code that is executed when your computer boots, when it starts up. So not part of the operating system, but uh, when your computer initially boots up, it usually runs some code in a particular part of the hard disk, the boot sector. And then that that code starts the operating system. So this is before the OS even in, uh, runs. So uh, often called the master boot record or the boot record. That is the part of the, the hard disk that will f then load the OS. If the virus can infect that boot record, then it can take control and stay hidden from everything that the OS does. So a virus that infects the boot sector can be very damaging or, uh, and very hard to find because uh, it can then hide itself from everything that the OS tries to, do, tries to do to detect that virus. But of course hard to infect because it's not dependent upon the operating system, it's dependent upon the, uh, the code that boots the computer. You usually need some way to uh, infect the computer using physical access. For example, plug in a USB disk which infects it. We'll look at some way, ways for distributing later. A common one, file infectors. That's like the example we saw, that the virus attaches itself to other files, executable files normally. A macro virus. So most of the file infectors are attached to executable files like word.exe things that the user normally executes, maybe even uh, uh, libraries which are used by executable files like DLLs in Windows. But another form is a macro virus. Many uh, systems allow the user to uh, essentially create their own executable files in the forms of macros to perform some operations automatically for the user. So you think about Microsoft Word and similar programs, you can program macros to do things automatically in Word. Those macros are not their own executable files, they're usually attached to documents. They're not programs, they're, well, they're not standalone programs, they are software that's attached to Word files, Excel files and so on. So if a virus can infect uh, such a, a file, a macro, when someone opens that document, 
the Word document, and that program runs the macro, then it's effectively executing the virus, and the virus can take effect then. And that was a very common form of how viruses infected different computers. Or a virus that uses multiple techniques to try and infect different systems. Another way, you can classify viruses by how they hide themselves, try and conceal themselves. So the idea from a virus's perspective, once it infects something, is to try and stay undetected from antivirus software. How does it do that? Uh, encrypt itself. Because if antivirus software looks for patterns of code in files, so a virus may have some common code in it to try and perform some operation. So what antivirus does is looks for patterns of code in some files, so it scans all your executable files. If it finds that pattern of code, then it detects a virus. How to hide that pattern? Encrypt yourself. So the virus encrypts itself such that when the antivirus scans, it will not find the pattern of code. So it usually has a, most of, its, it, of the virus code is encrypted and some key, and when the virus needs to run it, decrypts itself and then runs. Uh, similar, find other ways to hide itself. So a stealth virus explicitly has, creates its code such that it will be very hard for antivirus software to detect. So if you know the patterns that the antivirus software is looking for, create the virus such that it doesn't have those patterns. That's the concept. To avoid detection. Simple, a simple virus, when it infects another program, it just copies itself to the other program. The same code is copied. So when you infect word.exe and then you infect xl.exe, the same virus code is copied to xl.exe. It stays the same. A polymorphic virus tries to change itself, changes the code whenever it infects the other uh, programs. It performs some mutation. So, wh why? Well, because antivirus software is designed such, well, in a simple antivirus software, it looks again for patterns of code. So if the antivirus software is programmed that it knows about a particular virus, it knows the code of that virus, then it just scans the files looking for that pattern. And once it finds it, it's found the virus. But if the virus is changing itself all the time, then what does the antivirus software scan for? Okay, so the idea for the virus then is to change itself when it infects other files. So when the antivirus software scans for this pattern of code, it may find the first instance of when it's infected, but when it infected other programs, it's changed its pattern, so the antivirus software will not find it. How do you change code such that it still operates the same? Uh, you can do simple things like Often in code, you can rearrange the ordering of the code. It will still do the same thing, but you can change the order of ordering of the instructions. Um, what's an example? Let's say the code, the virus code itself, does some operations. It has some calculations. So one option is that. Uh, the virus code sets some variables. Uh, x is set to x plus 1. We increment some counter. This is the, the lines of code in the virus. And then the, the next line sets some other variable. So there's some variables in the code to make the virus work. And let's say there are two variables, x and y, and it the code sets them to the values. So if the antivirus software knows about this virus, 
it will go and look for patterns of code and the pattern will include these two instructions. Well, now the virus, when it wants to infect another file, it doesn't just copy the code as is to the other file, it changes the code. And a simple change is that, so this is just a portion of the code, there's other commands. When it infects another file, that's a simple example, just change the ordering of these. The virus will still do exactly the same thing, but the code will be different. And that makes it harder for antivirus software to look for the patterns of code, because now the antivirus software, to detect the virus here, needs to look for different combinations of the ordering of the code. And right here, there's just two combinations, but if we have many lines of code, we can have many different combinations of how that code is structured. So the virus still does the same thing, but it, the code is ordered differently. Another thing is you can insert operations that do nothing. Uh, another variation, most uh, systems have, what, a no-op operation. which is, a, if you think of assembly language, it's an operation that does nothing. And then y equals y plus 2. So this is a third variant of that same virus. Very simple. When the virus copies itself, it inserts some operations that doesn't change the behavior of the virus. The virus still does the same thing, but the code is different. Okay, so that's a polymorphic virus. It makes it harder for antivirus to look for the patterns of code because now it needs to look for many combinations of the pattern of the code. The next step up is a metamorphic virus. It tries to change itself, the same as a polymorphic virus, but also changes it, its behavior. So a polymorphic virus changes its appearance. It changes the way it looks, but not, the way, not what it does. A metamorphic virus does more than that. It also changes its behavior. So it does something different from the original version. And that makes it even harder for antivirus to detect. Because if the virus is doing different things, again, if we look at patterns, it's harder. And if we look at the operations of the virus, it becomes harder from antivirus's perspective. So, continuing with our simple example, a metamorphic virus may okay, change when it copies itself to the new program. It does something different. The significance of these operations is, is not important, but the, the code changes its behavior. Now it's a, a different piece of software not just in appearance, but in operation. Of course, that's hard from a virus perspective because changing the behavior, it still needs to do what it's trying to do of infect and to perform some damage. So it's harder pr to program such viruses, but if you can, it's harder to detect them. There are, there are essentially development environments and libraries that virus writers can use to support such changes. That is, the virus program pro programs their code and then there are libraries that it can use to, to, to change the behavior, uh, to change the appearance and change the behavior of that code. So, Viruses try to may infect different targets, infect different victims, and try to change themselves in different ways so that they stay hidden from uh, the user, in particular antivirus software. What causes overlap? Uh, is, can it be the uh, the same file is true by as the system file? The same file. 
uh, okay, so uh, yeah, another way to change or to hide is to uh, make you make the um, make the virus look like it's it's useful on the computer system, make it look like it's performing some normal operation. But currently, when we're looking at viruses, they are infecting existing files. Okay, mm -hmm. so they are infecting a file that already is useful on the system. Now you can infect, if you infect particular types of files then it may be harder for the antivirus software to detect, yes. Infecting um, some, some user application versus infecting operating system files, it may be harder for the, the antivirus to detect. So yes, the, the particular file that it tries to infect maybe a way of hiding itself. So system files, for example, may be he better than infecting Word and, and other applications, user files. Have a look at an example. Actually, we'll, we'll come back and we'll look at a different type of malicious software and then look at an example of, of a virus. Worms. There's some similarities between a virus and a worm. A virus infects a program and copies itself to other programs. What's a worm do? A worm is a program, usually a standalone program, that seeks out other, usually other computers, to infect. So a worm, you, so a virus may run on a, a, an individual computer. It may not necessarily try and infect other computers. It's infecting other pieces of software. Whereas a worm is typically looking to infect other computers. But they use the similar techniques. And sometimes we uh, cannot distinguish between them. So we'll see an example. Um, so some program that tries to infect other computers, other machines. And to infect other computers you need usually some network access and to get network access to another computer to be able to copy files, so the, the worm, maybe it's infected my computer, it wants to infect your computer, to do so it needs to be able to contact your computer across the network and somehow copy a file the infected file from my computer to yours. So to do so, it usually takes advantage of some bugs in network software, in client software like browsers, or in server software like web servers, secure shell, or, or login servers. So the idea is that once one computer is infected, that worm will look for bugs present in other computers so it can gain the ability to copy itself to that other computer, therefore infecting that other computer. Similar to the virus, the worm when it runs on your computer can do damage. Okay. But then it copies itself to other computers to try and do damage on those computers as well. So it requires some network connections to spread. Although there are other ways to spread. You don't have to spread via just network via the internet. You can spread via manual means, shared media. Okay, so the worm has infected my computer. I plug my USB to copy some files. The worm automatically copies itself to my USB. I give you my USB to share some files and the worm then copies itself to your computer. So the spreading of the worm may not, be via, may not just be via the internet, it may be via shared media. Another way to spread is to attach to emails. So again, using the network, but using specifically emails, because many people share emails. Uh, again, like a virus, the worm may be activated by some event, some trigger, and that may trigger it to, to replicate, to copy itself to other computers via different means, and usually carry some payload that may do some damage. So the payload is the thing that performs the function of the worm, like delete all the files on your computer. So there's similarities between the virus. The, the main difference is, is that a virus copies itself to other software. A worm copies itself to other computers.
How does a worm copy itself to other computers? How does it replicate? Email is one common form, or instant messaging. So when people send the emails to other computers, the worm attaches itself to the email and therefore can it potentially infect. If that worm is attached to the email and someone as, say, an attachable program, and someone opens that email and then opens a program, runs the program, then they infect their own computer. And it may not just be programs, it may be attachment to a document if we use a macro. Okay? Again, macros are usually attached to documents which can be executed. File sharing, so the way when people f share files, if one of those files is the worm, that they can infect other computers. The worm itself may have the ability to copy itself via a network. So if the worm is infected on my computer and the worm can log into your computer via maybe some vulnerability in your computer, you haven't set up the security on your computer so that someone can log in, then it can copy itself to other computers. All right, that was remote login. Remote execution is similar where we, uh, uh, what have we got? Execute a copy. Execute a copy of itself on another system. So uh, different ways for copying itself remotely. So there are remote procedure calls. For example, programs can have remote procedure calls that you can uh, call a pro procedure or a program on a different system. So usually to replicate, the worm uses network access and to get network access to some other computer, and remember the worm is usually software running. There's no one user controlling that and, and using that software. It needs to automatically be able to find other computers, copy itself to other computers, and then infect them. To do so, usually you need some bugs in those other computers. Because normally a computer should be set up such that no one can copy files to your computer remotely. But if there are bugs in the software you're running, then maybe they can. Let's have a look at two or three examples of both viruses and worms. In fact, well, the first one we'll see is uh, considered both. And you don't need to, to write this down, just some examples some, uh, of different, what was called the Melissa virus, in fact also considered a worm. So in 1999, uh, this was released by some guy, and the approach was that they posted some message to some news group, so, so I think some forum, they posted here's a message, and it contained a Word document as an attachment, and that Word document contained some macro code, so some things to do something automatically, and that macro code contained the virus. Uh, we'll look at the virus in a moment. It, so someone downloaded the Word document, they opened it in Word, which executed automatically the, the macro code, which executed the virus, and the virus then went to work and then copied itself to other Word files. And then as those Word files were distributed across between computers, say people sent it as an email attachment, other people executed it. It turned out it's, it caused about a billion US dollars of damage because, mainly because it infected many systems and therefore people had to shut down their computer systems to, to remove the virus and that cost a lot of uh, downtime, that is users not, not working and, and cost a lot of money. The guy was arrested and spent two years in pri prison. Uh, I think maybe we said at the start of the course, but uh, I hope it's obvious that we're talking about viruses, uh, they can of course do damage, so we need to understand how they work so that we can detect them, not to program them, but to understand how to detect them. There, there are serious, serious consequences of running viruses. Let's have a look at the Melissa virus. It's an old one, but uh, you don't need to understand all the details, but it was a, a visual basic script. 
a macro for Word. You may have seen them for, for different uh, office documents. You can have some code in, using Visual Basic. And it's only a, a couple of hundred lines, so it's not very complex. This is the code. Um, and I don't understand all of it, but we'll just highlight some important things, what it does. Uh, if you know, and this is, remember this is 10, 15 years ago, that in Word there are some security features to do you automatically execute macros when you open a Word document that contains macros. Okay, so you, someone sends you a Word document, you open it up in Word. If it includes macros, should Word run them? Or does it give you a prompt saying, this document has macros, do you trust it? Do you want to run it? The first steps were to try and disable that feature, to set, to set this security feature to be false, such that the user, if the, when they open the document, it automatically runs the macro code. Okay, so that was the first step, which is what this code is doing, to try and set one of the controls, the security controls in Word, such that it's turned off. And it's by setting some registry entry. I will not see the details, but it's a registry entry in Windows that disables that feature. So try and make it so that it's easier to infect in the future. And this one used email to distribute. So the, the virus infected Word documents. So it was macro code attached to Word documents. But then it distributed itself by sending that Word document in an attachment to an email to other people. So of course for this to work you must have Word installed. And you must open the document in Microsoft Word. And it also required the user to have Microsoft Outlook, the email client, installed. Because what it did is it opened the Outlook software and automatically sent emails. And the next piece of code does that. Essentially open up Microsoft Outlook, not open it graphically, but access it via some API. Uh, so if you have Outlook, then, and this code is go through the address book. So Microsoft Outlook, the email client has a list of addresses, your contacts, if it's running on your computer. Goes through that address book and finds the first 50 entries in your address book. So there's some loop here to go through 50 times saying, find the first 50 people in your contacts in your address book. And for each of them, create an email where the subject is, this is the subject, is the important message from the username is the username of this computer. Steve, for example, if it's my computer. So the email subject, important message from Steve. The email body, here is that document, document you asked for. Don't show anybody, I think it says. And then, don't show anyone else. And then it attaches this Word document to that email. Attachment, add the active document, the current document. So the Word document that was already infected is attached to an email and sent to 50 people in your contact list. And those 50 people receive an email. If some of them open it, then it infects their computers and does the same on their computers. Goes through their Outlook, Outlook email list and sends to 50 other people's, other people. And you can imagine that even if only five of those 50 open the email, the others were smart enough not to open it, but if five of them then it spreads quite quickly. I send to 50, 5 open. Those 5 send to another 50 and 5 open. So I've sent to 5. They send to another 5. 25 happens again, 125. And it happens a few times and you've got a million people who have been infected. Uh, what else does it do? Once it infects a document, it, so if you've opened the Word document, it tries to infect the template in Word. Know that when you open Word, usually it opens up a document using the standard template, the standard format. 
which is actually a file itself. So what it tries to do is attach this code to the template. What that means is the next time you open Word with another document which is not infected, that template which contains a virus is attached to that document that you, you create next time. So the next document you create or open is also infected. So it continues to infect files on your computer by attaching to the template. Sorry. What else does it do? It, these are just some checks to only try to infect if it's not already infected. So some check. If we don't contain the word Melissa in it, don't infect it. If we don't contain the word Melissa, infect. If it does, don't infect. Uh, what else? So that, that's the code for attaching, I think, to the templates. And that's it. Ah, one last thing, what's called down the bottom. If, the, if we consider the current time now, if the day is the same as the minute, so today is the 26th, is it? The 26th of December, the day is 26. If the minute is in 22 minutes at time 10.26, the day is the same as the minute, then it displays some message on the screen or in some error console, whatever the, the virus writer wanted to display. So this is a ca case of something happening at a particular event. So an example, it's only 110 lines. And this caused, say, a billion dollars damage in the world. So it's not great code. It, it's, at that time, very easy to implement, but it's very severe consequences. You can find that code on many websites. There are others, okay? This is slides sh show a few. We will not go through any others in detail. Code Red was a particular worm that it spread via web servers. Okay? That was spreading by email, the previous one. So Microsoft Web Server, the Internet Information Server, IIS. So what happened? <coughs> the, the code was sent to a particular web server uh, so normally browsers send requests to web servers, get requests. And the web server gets the, gets the document and sends it back. But in fact you can send commands or you can send, uh, like with, when you have forms, you can send data to web servers. So this worm sent data to web servers and in particular some of the Microsoft web servers of a particular version had a bug in it such that if the request to the web server was structured correctly, the web server would load the information in the request in memory and execute it. So that's a problem. Normally a web server will not execute code it receives, but there was a bug such that it would execute the code in a request. So the, the malicious user created a request such that it took advantage of this bug in the web server and the request contained the code, the malicious code, and it was loaded into the web server and executed. And it was stored in memory, because normally web servers run continuously. So it was stored in RAM, and it did different operations. If you rebooted the web server, it would disappear. But most web servers run continuously for, for days and for months. So it was always there. What did it do? It went through different states. This, once it was infected the web server, the code was running, it would send requests to random IP addresses with the intention of infecting them. So once you've infected one web server, for 19 days of the month, it would choose random IP addresses, send requests to them, hoping to infect web servers at those random addresses. If you send to enough, you should get a few that you can infect. So infect others to spread. Then for eight days of the month it did a denial of service attack on a particular website. So it sent many requests to that website. All of these infected servers are sending requests to this one website with a 
hope of overloading that website. And then it did nothing for a few days and then repeated. It was estimated that it infected 200,000 web servers in just for the first five hours of operation. So it spread very quickly. Just five hours, it's infected many computers on the internet. Not home computers, but web servers, usually. And it used up, used up many resources. So it's effectively a denial of service attack. It denies users access to the web servers. In another topic, we'll look at detailed denial of service attacks. And there are variations of that. So that was another example of a, of a worm. I love, I love you worm was another one more damaging in terms of cost. Uh, last one I don't have here. A, well, we'll mention two recent ones and I will not go into detail. Um, Stuxnet was a, a more recent worm. Uh, I have a, a document that people have analysed Stuxnet and we'll just highlight some features of that. And so this is in, from 2011 and just a, a report on this Stuxnet worm. What it did was that it used different ways to spread. Remember a worm is malicious software that spreads to other computers. And this one used network connections to spread. So it tried to copy itself across a LAN. So if it's infected my computer it tries to copy to other computers. But it also infected via USB and other shared media. So if I plugged a USB into my computer, it copied to the USB. And then when someone transferred the USB to another computer and plugged it in, it copied from the USB to their computer to infect. And then it did some damage. And the damage it did was it was targeting specific hardware. And the thoughts is it was a tar targeting uh, nuclear facilities and other facilities in uh, Iran to shut down those facilities. So it was a very complex attack and I'll just try and highlight some character characteristics of it. Uh, just as an example, you may not be able to read this, but it, it replicated by removable drives that is USB drives or hard disks. Okay. So that was one form of replication. Now, often nowadays operating systems, um, all, right, it, all right, we'll come back to that one. It replicated via LAN, so if it was on one computer, it tried to copy to other computers and it took advantage of bugs in uh, Windows printing servers. So every Windows operating system has a, a printing server so you can print to, to printers across the network. There was a bug in this printing server such that it allowed computers to copy the file to other computers. So it took advantage of bugs in some of the software. Uh, so in some of the network capabilities of Windows had other bugs that allowed to copy. So different means of replicating itself. Uh, what else can we highlight? It took advantage of four unpatched Microsoft vulnerabilities or bugs. So if the computers were running Windows and they weren't up to date, that is that they haven't had the most recent updates and there were bugs in those software, then it had a chance to copy itself. So an important point there is that one way to stop the spread of worms and viruses is to have up-to-date software, not just up-to-date operating systems but up-to-date applications because there are always bugs in software and therefore most malicious software tries to take advantage of those bugs so to stop them update your software such that uh, those bugs are not existent. What, it, what did it do? So once it infected many computers it contacted a command and control server so once it infected a computer, it contacted some server on the internet and tried to download an up updated version of the malicious software. So it's infected my computer, but maybe there's a new version of the virus or the, the worm. So it contacts a server 
and downloads the new version so it updates itself. So it can continually change and improve. Uh, and then what did it do? And maybe the last point. The idea was that the, the computers that are infected were the targets were attached to hardware that controls industrial systems, factories and so on. And in particular in a nuclear power plant there are centrifuges and there is what's called PLCs, programmable logic controllers, the hardware that controls different industrial systems that makes equipment work. So the computer was attached to that. This worm then infected that controller, the PLC, with the aim of making that controller operate the industrial system outside of its normal behavior. And what people think is the aim was to make, say, the centrifuges, think if they spin, to make them spin too fast such that they'll fail so that the factory or the nuclear power plant will, will shut down, it will not work. So it had a very specific aim of shutting down particular hardware, it attacked or, or targeted specific hardware, Siemens uh, logic controllers. It's thought that it was a one of the most complex worms seen and probably cr created by some government or some country. So there are many details of it. This document goes through 50 or 60 pages explaining them. We will not go through them. Uh, just some highlights. So the timeline uh, from 2008 through to 2010, uh, maybe more interesting, who did it infect? And they, the Symantec is an antivirus software company that uh, tries to keep track of the infections across different software and different computers. And it turned out that most of the infected computers were from Iran, IR here, infected very few other computers in other countries. So the thought is that it was targeting a particular country and in particular factories or, or uh, machinery in that particular country. So it was a very advanced worm. And uh, the difference between some of the examples we saw is that it deliberately spread slowly to avoid detection the Melissa virus, the Code Red and other worms spread quite quickly, 200,000 servers in five hours. Quickly noticed, okay, it did a lot of damage but people noticed that within a day or within a few hours and then found ways to stop it. Whereas with Stuxnet it was spread slowly. It in fact infected two or three computers and then deleted itself with the aim that no one would be able to detect it. And it was thought that it was in the wild, that it was infecting computers for one or two years before it was even detected. So doing damage before people detected it. I think you can browse through that document. You'll see in the first few talks about who it infected. And then it goes through details of how it went through the approach of infecting and how long it took to infect. So I'll let you browse through that only if you're interested. What else can we do? We have viruses, we have worms. What's social engineering? Tricking users into allowing the malicious user to compromise their system. Okay, using uh, social, uh, using techniques to, to make a user think that you can access their system or you should be able to access their, their system. And there are two main ways. Spam is common. What is spam? Well, unsolicited email. You receive emails, no one, you didn't ask for them or they're from people who um, you don't know. And many emails, bulk email. And often those emails are containing either attachments with malicious software or links to websites with malicious software. The idea is that uh, the email contains some message that you think is relevant for you 
and you follow the instructions in that email. For example, it says, uh, please click on this link to reset your password for the SIT login system. So you click on the link because you're a student in SIT and you click on the link to change your password and the actual website that allows you to change the password collects your password. It's not the real SIT website, it's the malicious user's website. You enter in your username and password, now the malicious user knows your username and password. So this is using social engineering because the user is tricked into thinking that this was an email from the, the SIT computer center, but it was from some malicious user. That's an example of a phishing attack. Trojan horses are software, useful software, normal software, that also perform harmful functions. So there's some software that uh, does something that you need it to do. It converts Word documents to PDF. Okay? You need to convert a Word to PDF. You download the software, convert it. But the software also contains some harmful functionality. In the background, it's also uh, collecting information about your computer, about you, or doing something malicious. So that's an example of a Trojan horse. So you're tricked into using that harmful software because you think it's useful software. And in fact, it is useful software, but it's also harmful software. What have we got left? We'll come back to the others next week. Phishing, so an example of social engineering. Uh, like the example I said, you trick someone into accessing some site. So you send someone spam email, unsolicited email, and it contain, contains a URL, and it contains a message such that the reader of the email thinks it was to them, and they are tricked into doing something that they shouldn't have to do. So the example is that a login page. You receive an email, it looks like it's from your bank. It contains a URL saying, please update your password. You haven't refreshed it for the last six months. So go to this URL and change your password. The URL is in fact that pointing to some malicious web server, not the real bank web server, and that you um, enter in your username and password and now that malicious user knows your username and password for your bank. Okay. I think you may have seen, you probably see such emails like this um, called phishing. Spear phishing is a specific instance where it's an attack on a particular recipient. So maybe someone knows me. So it's a student doing spear phishing on me. They know something about me. So they t tailor the email to be specific to me. They say, uh, dear Dr. Steve, um, your account for the SIT login needs updating from the computer center. Okay, so they can target the message particularly to, be, to me to make it easier to fool me into visiting a particular site and doing something wrong. We'll go through a few of the other slides on Thursday next week. It won't take long, 20 minutes or so. We'll look at some other malicious software. And then we'll try and review some of the material and talk about what's in the midterm exam. So we'll have a lecture on Thursday next week. Uh, we'll finish this, won't take long, and then talk about the midterm exam. Questions about any of the things we've done? <coughs>